Reproduce the product and never buy whatever one you want and save. So we got to do like seven or eight. Maybe ten rolls is okay. All right, we're going to go on this chapter until we get to the diseases, which ends the respiratory on this syllabus. And then next week, they'll pick up, uh, or Van will pick up where I left off on this, okay? Um, you got to work. Huh? Yeah, I'm on duty. Every once in a while. I gotta work again. Tuesday, okay. All right. Now, let me say something here. Um, next week uh, on your syllabus is like a capnography intro. I want everybody to at least go online, watch my podcast on capnography. You already did that. Right? You already has watched it. Well, watch it again. Okay. Okay. <laughs> because capnography now is the gold standard. Okay. Um, if this, uh, this afternoon, if time prevails, I don't want you guys to sit and lecture all day today. Um, you know, we'll do another capnography thing, but if you guys haven't seen it yet, go on to my, my podcast, it's on YouTube, um, and watch that capnography video. It's on YouTube, Chris Johnson, capnography? I don't know how to search for it on, on YouTube. Just go to my blog, it's on my blog. It's on the it's website too, the FMTI website. It's on the FMTI website? Yeah, the EDU. It's right under it. If, if you just type in paramedic. It's right there. Cap oh, oh, on JV course? Yeah. Oh, yeah, JV. Actually, I thought you meant like the website. Then. Oh, yeah, no, no, website. no, no, no. Like, JV course, sorry. Is it on that? Yeah. What? Yeah. Google search on podcasts. You can just, you know, you know, shit about you can just go yeah, on JV yeah. course. It's right on that. It says capnography. Okay. Yeah, just watch that video. Part of your homework. Just go ahead and watch that. Get a nice sound basis of, uh, of CO2. All right. Okay. Um, next week, it's on your syllabus. I just want to make sure that you guys, it comes out of my mouth. For next week. Anyway, all right. So also assessing your patients, you're looking at sputum. Now sputum is important, all right? You're gonna get test questions on there that talk about sputum. If your patient is having a productive cough and they're producing sputum, you might just wanna take a second and look at it. What does it look like? Is it clear? Is it blood tinged? You know, blood tinged sputum that's being coughed up. What's number one on your differential? CHF, all right? So blood tinged sputum. Your thing is CHF. Now, other things can cause it too, like bronchitis can cause the coughing up of blood. Um, pneumonia can cause coughing up of blood. Pneumothorax can. Um, so when we say coughing up of blood, what's the medical term for that? Blood tinge to the... Um, hemoptysis. All right. Hemoptysis is actually coughing up blood. So if you have a patient presenting with hemoptysis, your number, your, your two main causes of that is bronchitis and tuberculosis. All right, so TB. So you're thinking bronchitis, tuberculosis, if you add that into blood tinge sputum, not just blood, but actual sputum, <coughs> mucus, that's blood tinge, you're thinking CHF. All right? Another thing that if your patient is coughing up blood, really start getting to the habit of asking questions, like poking, right? Do, are they really coughing up blood? Or are they vomiting blood? Sometimes they get it confused. And I'm not saying that you know they're stupid. I'm just saying that maybe they're not really coughing up blood. Maybe they're coughing so much, you know, that they that they might some stuff comes up and it's actually coming out of a different tube, and it's a different body system, and you're thinking more GI than respiratory. All right. So kind of get that one out of the way when you're assessing your your patients. All right. Your pulse oximetry on your monitoring devices. Measures the percentage of oxygenated hemoglobin. And you can kind of change the term of that. Pulse oximetry is going to measure anything that's attached itself to hemoglobin. Whether or not it's carbon monoxide, whether or not it's carboxyhemoglobin, whether or not it's methemoglobin, or whether or not it's, 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 it's regular oxyhemoglobin. All right? Okay. Yeah. TV, where is the blood coming from? Lungs. Yes. Lung tissue itself. Okay. Um, would you mask up or would you mask them up? Both. <laughs> Mask the truck up, I mask my dog up. Yeah, that's right. Level A entry suit. Yeah, I'd I put a, a mask on them, like some low flow, like maybe eight liters per minute. Here's their hisomoxine when in actuality you're burying them. Yeah. And then to put a mask on myself because I don't want tuberculosis. No. <laughs> but again, your pulse oximetry is a tool, it's not a gold standard. Don't hang your hat on anything. 
all right? One of the things I hate the most is when a paramedic says, I don't need to intubate this guy because his O2 sats are 98%. It doesn't matter. You're not looking at oxygen saturation when you're based on assessing the respiratory status of your patient. The only thing that that says is that that hemoglobin is saturated with 98% of something, right? It could be carbon monoxide, it could be anything, right? So that's why we get chronically high right? O2 sats when the patient has carbon monoxide poisoning. It's a false positive, right? Now keep in mind that oxygen attached to hemoglobin, when combined with using our CO2, now we have a great you know, predictor of respiratory status, right? We're looking at respiratory rate. We're seeing that that respiratory rate is equal to that CO2 that we're reading, right? If they're hyperventilating, we would expect a CO2 reading of what? Low. Low, because they're blowing off their CO2. But what if I have a hyperventilating patient <coughs> with a high CO2, right? A high CO2 is what? Respiratory alkalosis or acidosis? And acidosis. 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 And respiratory failure equals what? Respiratory acidosis. Well, wait a minute. A COPD patient is chronically respiratory acidotic, even though they're hyperventilating, right? Even though they're tachypnic. Their CO2 levels aren't low, they're high, right? And that's because of breath stacking. That's because of the air trapping, right? I could be breathing fast all day long, but if what I'm breathing out isn't breathing out carbon dioxide enriched air, my CO2 levels aren't going to lower. Does that make sense? All right? So, with, in, in that case, if it gets too extreme, you, you can treat them so by heart? No. No, okay. The number one cause, the one number one treatment of respiratory acidosis is decrease the ventilation rate. Okay. Decrease the ventilation rate. So, control the breathing, obviously. Control the breathing. All right? Two things affect CO2 production rate, tidal volume. Two things affect that, right? Okay. I mean, Respiratory physiology test 101. You want to adjust somebody's CO2 level, you adjust the rate. If that doesn't work, then you go to the tidal volume. All right? But respiratory acidosis, high CO2 levels is type 2 respiratory failure. And in your COPD patients with, with CO2 levels in the 50s and 60s, with acute, on, with a, I mean, a, like an, an onset of dyspnea, they're in respiratory failure. All right? And they're probably going to be, they're probably going to have to be ventilated. All right? So anyway. Pulse ox, percentage of oxygenated hemoglobin, end tidal CO2, we know that. We got the cannulas and we have the end tidal 2 uh, side stream samplers, right? That measures CO2. Peak expiratory flow, by definition, would be your maximum flow rate of expiration, maximum, not on a normal, right? You give a maximum exhalation breath, that would be your peak expiratory flow. Go ahead and read it. <coughs> Your partner listens to her breath sounds and hears wheezing throughout her lungs that are very diminished. Her pulse rate is tachycardic with a rate of 118 beats per minute. Her blood pressure is 130 over 74. Skin is warm, dry, and normal in color. What do you need to know about this patient? Uh, what do you need to know? Yeah. History. Is she asthmatic? History. How about everything? Yeah. Right? What's her history? What medications is she taking? How long has she been presenting like this? What's her normal baseline status? I mean, is she a three-pack a day for 50 years smoker and chronically wheezes all the time? Or is this a new onset? Right? Her skin is warm, dry, normal in color. I always say that one of the most ominous signs that you could ever see on a patient is what? Diaphoresis, right? If a patient's diaphoretic, you should be diaphoretic. Because the patient's sick, but they're warm, dry, normal in color, which means they're perfusing. And with a blood pressure like that, and that's almost textbook Tampa Fire normal, right? Oof. I'm recording this. They're going to be like, oh, dear Chris, you're weird. Whatever. We didn't know everything, right? Test question 101. What is the most common airway obstruction in our conscious patient? Tongue. Tongue, right? Tongue. What respiratory sound are you going to hear if the tongue is blocking your snoring. airway? Snoring, right? There's two questions right off the bat. Excess soft tissue. Is it an anatomical problem, right? Is there just built-in innate anatomy that's blocking this patient's airway, right? A hot, infected airway. What we think of croup, right? Tracheobronchial disease, huh? Is that like a whale bark for a kid? Is that croup? Yeah, croup would give you that, that classic barking seal cough, right? But when you think of croup, croup is viral or bacterial? Which one do you think? Bacterial. No, viral, viral right? 
You had a 50% chance and you lost it. I know, man. Remember when EB Games was open? I said, this is how my mind works. This is when I was in Paramex. We had EB Games, right? EB Games was open. And we have CB Ph CVS Pharmacy, right? So I always remember that croup is viral and epiglottitis is bacterial. Are you serious? Yeah, you said that. Like, What's EB Games? What's that? EB Games was like a GameStop back in the day. Okay. It was called EB Games. It was in the malls. Electronics Boutique. Oh, okay. Electronics Boutique, that's, that's right. Okay, I've heard of that one. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, while I was going through Paramex, I'm like, okay, how can I remember this? You know, croup is viral, epiglottitis is bacterial. So I know that, you know, croup is a viral infection that kids get. Right? But the big problem with this is that it narrows the airway. Right? It narrows the airway, thus increasing, you know, airway resistance, causing bronchoconstriction, causing wheezing. These kids have upper airway inflammation, and they tend to get um, um, that upper airway barking type cough. Right? Maybe some strider. Right. Aspirate, huh? Is it the same as epiglottitis, or is that different? Epiglottitis is just an inflammation of the epiglottis. And if you have an inflammation of the epiglottis, you kind of just mechanically block air from entering the glottic opening. Right. When we do kids, I'll show you guys x-rays and stuff and how they diagnose it on x-ray. So aspiration. We're not talking about your goals in life. We're talking about, you know, you know the only one is to get out of this class, right? We're talking about content into the lungs, right? That's very bad. Aspiration pneumonia is bad. When you couple aspiration pneumonia with sepsis, you're looking at about a 60-70% mortality rate if the patient reaches the ICU. That is a huge number, right? Almost so big that they're starting to make septic centers, right? In our careers, I'd imagine that we're going to start calling septic alerts on patients, right? In a checklist form. I mean, we're calling stroke alerts on patients, we're calling cardiac alerts, we're calling trauma alerts, right? But sepsis kills more people than MIs. It kills more people than stroke, I think. Maybe not stroke. MIs definitely does, though. So why are we calling septic alerts? And you can probably bet the farm that that's going to happen within our career, is calling septic alerts and taking them to a septic center because the mortality rate is so high, right? But it's a profoundly dangerous condition. Something as simple as sitting your intubated, ventilated patients 30 degrees you know, in some studies, we decrease the rate of ARDS by 30%. And when I say ARDS is what? What is ARDS? Acute respiratory distress. Acute syndrome. respiratory distress syndrome, right? <laughs> this is the beginning stages of MODS and sepsis and all that stuff. ARDS leads to sepsis, right? Aspiration pneumonia leads to ARDS. And just by ventilating <coughs> or intubating your patient, ventilating them, and sitting that bed up 30 degrees, you know, while you're, you're bagging them, you know, will decrease your rate of ours by, they say, 30% in some studies. Right? Well, that's, that kind of makes sense because gravity comes into effect. There, you know? Gravity comes into effect. Your fluid isn't dispersing throughout the entire lung tissue. You're keeping it isolated. That's a whole bunch of good stuff. And just that, it's free. It doesn't take any extra training. Just sit your head up a little bit. Why not? All right? So just do it. It's just good practice. So aspiration treatment guidelines. Now, the new ACLS guidelines came out. And Part of that ACLS change in guidelines was that we always did, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The uh, uh, CELEX, right? Or we always gave, uh, it's not CELEX, it was the other term. Cricoid pressure. Cricoid pressure. We always gave everybody cricoid pressure that we're bagging, right? The new ACLS guidelines came out and said, don't do that on everybody that you're bagging. Right? In other words, old guidelines, whenever you're bagging somebody, you did cricoid pressure. Now, it's not recommended for everybody empirically. You're thinking about who needs it and who doesn't, all right? I mean, did your patient go into cardiac arrest in a restaurant right after they just got done eating? Because you can imagine that their stomach is full, right? So that's the full stomach theory. Whenever you go down and, and uh, go to innovate somebody, you're always thinking of the full stomach theory. That all of their gastric contents can now come up in your face and in their lungs, right? So if you are worried about that, on a patient-per-patient -patient basis, you can always use cricoid pressure, right? <clears throat> after you get done bagging and after you get done intubating your patient, get to the mindset that everybody gets an OG tube. Everybody, right? You tube somebody, they get an OG tube. It should just go hand in hand, right? Now, in Hillsborough County, it's give or take. Sometimes we have them, sometimes we don't, right? But always get into the habit of doing it. If you have a head injured patient that you're that you're intubated and now you're ventilating, nothing goes in the what? 
Nothing goes in the nose, right? Those patients get oropharynx, right? Those patients get OG tubes all day long. Your medical patients, you can do an NG tube. You can do that, all right? But either one. You want to decompress the stomach and protect your airway. Suction, suction, suction. Always have some forceps available. In case you go down there on that code who, you know, arrested in a restaurant, you put the blade in their mouth and you notice that there's a piece of meat sitting in their glottic opening. Have those forceps ready. All right. Now your obstructive airway diseases, there's three of them that we have to worry about. Emphysema, chronic bronchitis, and asthma. Those are COPD. They're all considered COPD. Now I'm guilty just like everybody else. I call emphysema COPD. It's one of those things. Right. But emphysema is emphysema. And all three of those things are COPD. It's like a blanket of crack. Right? Those three conditions are considered COPD. So <clears throat> I was talking about whenever you're assessing your patient with respiratory distress, you have to consider is this a ventilation issue, a perfusion issue, or a diffusion issue. Right? And we already talked about flail chest, pneumothorax, right? fat man sitting on my chest, crush injury. All those are ventilation problems. Right? It's all those have been like, I'm breathing fine. Yeah, I can breathe just fine. I just need to get the fat man off the chest. Right? I just need to decompress my thorax and get my lung expanded. Right? I just need to get the blood out of the pericardium and my heart will beat just fine. And I breathe just fine. Those are all ventilation problems. So when you talk about emphysema, we're not really talking about a ventilation problem. We're talking about a diffusion problem. Right? Emphysema is a problem with diffusion. Right? We have decreased alveolar surface membrane area. And if I have a decrease in membrane surface area, I have a decrease in surface area for oxygen and CO2 to exchange. And if that happens, my patient can become hypoxic. I have an absolute loss of surfactant, right? So therefore causing atelectasis, which in turn causes collapse in alveoli, which causes a decrease in alveolar surface membrane area, right? I smoke, right? Somebody smokes, it kills all the cilia in their bronchial tree, right? that tissue replaces itself with another non-cilia forming tissue, right? That's called metaplasia. Remember that from pathophysiology? So metaplasia happens. Now I don't have the scrubbing mechanism, so I produce more mucus. My lungs are more prone to getting infections, right? It is a perfusion problem. I'm sorry, it is a diffusion problem. Oxygen and CO2 can't readily exchange. Asthma. There's three killers in asthma. What are the three killers in asthma? Standard constriction. Constriction. Mucus production. Mucus production. What is it? No. no. Inflammation. <coughs> Inflammation. Well, wouldn't every constriction be, oh no, it's not. Yeah, constriction is just closing of the lumen. Inflammation is just swelling. All right? Which so be, yeah, which can cause further closing. So I got three killers, right? That's blocking in air from coming in. So is that a ventilation issue? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a ventilation issue. Right? <clears throat> so that's it while we first saw your medrol. Saw your medrol, yep. Any steroid, right? I used to give Decadron in the hospital. Saw your medrol, maybe. But if you've got an asthma patient who needs albuterol and atrovent and you're taking them to the hospital, they're going to get a steroid. So go ahead and push it. So your physical findings, we already talked about pursed lip breathing, our increased IE ratios, right, due to prolonged expiratory phase. We're looking for additional muscle use or accessory muscle use in JBD, right? Classic signs, or classic associated signs with COPD and lung problem patients is right heart failure, right? And a sign of that would be my JBD, right? <clears throat> this is where today's syllabus ends, but... We'll go for a couple more limbs. Can we, can we go back one slide, please? Huh? Specifically, all of the Respiratory diseases. That's where it starts in the slide. <clears throat> Ever tell you I had a instructor here once that was, um, he was lecturing? And he was pointing at the screen, right? He, it was set up just like this. He was pointing at the screen. He was showing people, but nobody was responding. And he started getting mad. He's like, it's what I'm pointing at. And he actually thought that his finger would show up on the screen. <laughs> Did he not like look? <laughs> it was, he wasn't a dumb guy too. It was just a I guess, momentary <laughs> lapse in 
brain function. Huh? <laughs> you know Frank Carell at AMR, the training guy at AMR. You know him? It was him. It was fun. He's gonna listen to this. He'd be like, Ah! I hate you. Anyway. Huh? Uh huh? All right. So asthma. Nobody really knows 100% what causes asthma. And this is a common theme, right? There's a theory out there that it's an overabundance of cholinergic activity, which causes bronchoconstriction, right? So the thing is a cholinergic overdrive. Some people aren't even calling it asthma anymore. They're calling it reactive airway disease because they don't have any, they really don't know what, what causes it, right? But our role is not actually treating the disease. It's treating the signs and symptoms of the disease, right? Every asthma patient you run on, you're not going to fix them. You can save their life but you're not going to face the disease itself. We treat the signs and symptoms of it. All right. So increased reactivity of trachea, bronchi, and bronchioles. So all that entire bronchial tree, whatever is lined with beta-2 receptors, can cause constriction. All right. And it's increased activity. Widespread narrowing of the airways. Right. So we have edema, which is the swelling. We have bronchoconstriction that causes a lot of harm. But we also have mucus production. And you know what out of those three things is the biggest killer? Mucus. Right? Mucus. We can't fix that right away. Fixing mucus is a prolonged phase, right? And if I have excess amount of mucus in my alveoli, oxygen and CO2 can't exchange. Anaerobic metabolism ensues. Patient goes into respiratory arrest and they die a hypoxic death. Right? We can treat bronchoconstriction. We have a whole bunch of meds that can do that. Right? We got breathine, we got mag, we got epi. You got atrovent. You know, we got everything on the truck that can fix constriction. Inflammation, we got cyamedrol. But cyamedrol is not going to work. Its, its effect doesn't even start until about an hour. Its peak effect doesn't start until about three or four hours, depending on what book you read. So it's not going to be helpful in the short term. But it does, you know, it, it does show to benefit your patient in the long term. Right? It decreases mortality. It decreases in hospital stay. It decreases <laughs> outbreaks. So these patients are going to get steroids. But it is not going to fix your acute dying asthma patients, right? So steroids, when given early, show a benefit in the long run. Steroids, when given early, do not show a benefit in the short term. And that's what we're worrying about on our dying asthmatic patient, right? Our dying asthmatic patient needs ventilation, bagging, maybe intubation, mag, epi. The more podcasts you listen to, the more of a debate you're going to hear this. And you're going to be like, you're going to hear a physician up there saying, if you have to intubate your asthma patient, you fail. You know? And you'll hear that. You'll hear that. You'll hear a physician say, I can't remember the last time I've intubated my, my acute asthma exacerbation. Okay? Good for you. That's awesome. You have an ER with unlimited resources, right? You have BiPAP, and you have EasyPAP, and you have non-invasive ventilation, and you have all this, you have that, and you can do that. Right? But intubating an asthma patient, you should really study about because it's bad. Right? Intubating an asthma patient, you should always try to get on first pass intubation. Always. All right? I'm, not, I'm not saying that we shouldn't try to get everybody on first pass, but especially an asthma patient, especially in aspirin overdose patients, specialized patients that you're intubating, you need first pass success because these patients are going to crump. All right? if you're down there messing around, right? If you have to intubate your asthma patient, these are the people that you need your experienced laryngoscopist on, right? The most experienced, and I'm sorry to say for you guys, right? But benefiting the patient here, that's not a teaching moment, all right? I have a question. So you know. <laughs> so an asthma attack, is that a bronchial spasm or an edema? Both. Or both? Both. Okay, so you know like albuterol and atrovent, okay, it's not going to really help the swelling. So that fails, and obviously, so your body will take forever to get on the scene to make the swelling go down. Correct. So that's when you obviously would go to mm -hmm. integration. Okay. Absolutely. Right. But, a bronch, but, but a bronchial spasm, albuterol would work. Absolutely. Right? I mean, it could be both. It could be just inflammation. It could be constriction. You have no idea. You can't, we don't, we can't bronchoscope them and look, right? So we got, we got to treat. If we hear wheezing, we treat it. If it goes away, great. I mean, there are patients that have, like, chronic asthma that take inhalers every day, right? 
and it works. There's people that'll, that'll call you because of an asthma exacerbation and you give them albuterol atrovin. Not only do they get better, but they don't want to go. You give them albuterol atrovin, they're like, oh, cool, that, that helped. I don't want to go to the hospital. Sweet. <clears throat> There'll be other asthmatic patients that you give albuterol atrovin and you're intubating them. You have no idea what's causing it, right? It would be safe to assume that if you're giving albuterol atrovin, their, their wheezing's not getting better. It could be a possibility that they just had massive inflammation, right? Kind of like a stuffy nose, right? If you blow your nose and there's no more boogers, is it the snot that's causing your, 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 your nose to be stuffy? No, it's inflammation. And no matter how much you pick your nose, you ain't going to help it. It's just inflamed. You've got to wait for the inflammation to go down, which takes process, right? So we've got to assume that. We've got to expect that, right? So whatever causes <clears throat> bronchospasm, like allergens or irritants, right, the number one treatment for these patients is to tell them to avoid the irritant, right? Avoid the dander, avoid the dust or the, the, the pollen or whatever triggers an asthma attack. That would be your number one treatment. Right? Kind of like a, not anaphylaxis, but allergic reaction, allergic response. Correct, right? And that's part of, you know, patient education is, hey, you know, doc, it hurts when I do this. Well, don't do that. You know, get rid of the cat. I mean, you might love Fluffy, but Fluffy is putting you into an asthma exacerbation a lot. Right. All right, so bronchial edema, we already talked about. The number one treatment for that would be your corticosteroids. But it takes a few hours to work, so they're not very beneficial in the, long, in, in the short term. In the long term, they are very beneficial, right? So we've got to consider that. Increased mucus production, right? The three things. Bronchoconstriction, inflammation, mucus production. Thick secretions can plug distal airways, and no matter how much you ventilate that patient, you can't get it out. You can't get it out, right? Unless you deep tracheal suction. You know, but in order to do that, the patient needs to be unconscious and intubated, <clears throat> right? So improve hydration, right? One of the ways that we can combat this is by giving fluid, right? Fluid, it disperses the mucus within the lungs a little bit better. Now, this is not a fluid overload. I know, I know that's going through your head. Yeah. You're like, CHF has mucus in the lungs. It's not a fluid overload problem. Okay. This is just mucus that's there, right? So you want to dilute it down, so to speak. Correct. We always remember, in CHF, it's left ventricular failure, causing pulmonary hypertension, causing diffused fluid out, creating fluid in the lungs. Not essentially mucus. Fluid in the lungs, right? My body can't excrete it. Renal failure happens. More fluid comes on. My input exceeds my output. Fluid overload happens. No fluid for those patients. Make sense? Those patients need Lasix, diuretics, fluid overload. These patients are not fluid overload. It's mucus, right? So if we give these patients fluid, it's going to loosen up the mucus a little bit, water it down, for lack of a better term, and they'll be able to ventilate <clears throat> a little bit better. So these patients could benefit from getting a little bit of fluid. If this is an asthma patient, right? So we give mucolytics or expectorants, right? Once we give fluid, we loosen up that mucus a little bit, we give an expectorant. An expectorant is a what? <clears throat> what does an expectorant do? It helps you cough it up, right? We've all had that junk in our lungs before that we cough, no matter how much we cough, we can't get it out, right? I think she's experiencing that right now. So you... <clears throat> You give an expectorant, which loosens it up, so now you can have a productive cough and get that mucus out. So would the treatment be the same for, like, the cystic fibrosis kid? Uh, in the short term, yeah. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> All right. So, potentially fatal asthma. These are charts. These are potentially fatal asthma. And what do we see within there? Seriously? Respiratory acidosis. Now keep in mind, your COPD patients, 50 or they're you know 70 years old, been smoking for 50 years, you know eight packs a day. They're chronically in respiratory acidosis. They are compensated respiratory acidosis, right? They're still in type two failure, but they're in a chronic respiratory acidosis. <clears throat> your 30 year old in an acute asthma exacerbation shows up to the ER with a pH of 7.2 and, an, and, a, and, a, and a CO2 of 60, right? They're in acute respiratory acidosis, which is defined as potentially fatal asthma, right? That needs to be corrected. Previous intubation, that's a bad sign. Two or more episodes of spontaneous pneumo, right, that we usually see with lung condition patients like COPD and asthma. That's bad. So would our treatment still be the same uh, on each one of these different types of asthma being 
uh, bumper restriction, uh, edema, or lupus? Our treatment would be the same because we don't know what's causing it. Right. right? The key with the asthma, though, <clears throat> is even though your patient is crumping and they're falling asleep on you, they're bobbing their head, right? And you do make the conscious decision to our side that many two of them. Did you fix the problem? No. No, they're still constricted. They're still inflamed, and they still have mucus production. So granted, you might have prevented them from dying a hypoxic death right there. What do you still have to treat? Everything. You still got to give them steroids. You still got to give them albuterol and atrovent to open that up. Right? Now, <clears throat> you know those BVMs? You see the BVMs? You ever see the BVMs with the, um, the little gauge on the side of it? Mm -hmm. Right? People usually just pop that off and have no idea what that's used for. Right? That's actually a PIP measurement. Right? And PIP stands for pulmonary inspiratory pressure. It measures PIP. And you'll see it from 0 to 40. Right? Normal is less than 30. We want to really keep it like 20, 25. 40 is like danger, danger, danger. It's measuring the peak inspiratory pressure. So it means if I took that bag that has that gauge on the side of it and I put my finger over the hole where that beat where the air comes out, that you'll see that gauge go burr, burr. it'll increase like to 40 because you're plugging the hole, right? So if you just keep that in mind and you put that bag on a tube and you start bagging somebody and that gauge is rising all the way to 40, what is that telling you? It pushes your heart. Mm -mm. Well, it yes, okay, yes, you can be too vigorously bagging. There's a ton of resistance. And what causes a ton of resistance? Inflammation, edema, bronchoconstriction, pneumothorax, right? Remember in EMT school, you're checking for bag compliance. It's getting hard to bag, right? These patients are going to be the same thing. These are the patients where you're bagging. I don't know if you've ever had this before, but you're bagging them, and it's like, like you're really forcefully trying to bag. It shouldn't be like that, right? Because that's because you're bagging against an increased airway resistance due to the bronchoconstriction. So we still have to treat the problem, even though we tubed them, right? These patients don't need a size 7 tube, right? You want to intubate these people with 8s. You want to try to at least, right? You know, medics say, oh, bigger is better. You know, go big or go home. How about get whatever you can and then not get sued, right? I like that theory a little bit better. Yeah, but if you go bigger, like, like an 8... Mm -hmm. um, and you innovate them. Mm -hmm. um, I understand the, the thought process that once you fix the inflammation, obviously you have open, you know, a tube down to open our airway and it's not being able to do its job. But if it's constricted and you go bigger, and bigger than what the constriction allows you to do, aren't you starting to tear, rip, end up doing more well, damage? Well, you could, you could cause damage, but what I'm saying is that when you're down their tube and you have a size 8 tube and it passes freely, I mean, no resistance, it just passes right in, then you're great. But if you're pushing that tube in and it's like not going in, mm -hmm. you stop. And you, you, you know, that's why you have a backup size tube. You get a seven and a half okay. and you try to pass it, right? But the thought process behind it though is that one, you can't fit anything down a size seven or seven and a half tube, you know? And when these patients, you're thinking of the long term, they get into the ER, they're going to get a bronchoscope. You can't fit anything but like a pediatric size bronchoscope down a seven or seven and a half tube, right? So one, that tube is probably gonna have to be exchanged for a bigger tube, right? Two, you are decreasing airway resistance by intubating them with a bigger size tube, right? <clears throat> so you don't wanna add airway resistance to an already increased airway resistant problem, right? So you want to try to use as big tube as possible as you can, right? And then maybe get some albuterol and atrovent and inline nebulize it, right? We have those on the trucks. We have, a, the, the, we have some in the lab, you can see. But after you intubate your patient, you put it on, and you attach a, um, a nebulizer mask to it. <clears throat> that nebulizer has to go to oxygen. The bag has to go to another oxygen. And you're bagging in albuterol and atrovent now. You're bagging it in. Right? If it's a COPD patient or emphysema patient, they might benefit from some PEEP. Right? Putting some PEEP on the bag. And do you know what I mean by that when I say PEEP on the bag? Right? We're, we're creating a positive pressure. Now, if you have a ventilator that allows you to give PEEP, you can dial in, you know, five centimeters of water PEEP, and that means it's pulmonary and expiratory pressure. That means at the end of expiration, there's still going to be some back pressure, right, in the lungs. There's still going to be some back pressure, which is going to keep the alveoli open. 
which allows for gas exchange. COPD is an alveolate problem, right? So that would help. If you don't have a ventilator, it's kind of hard to do that besides putting some pressure on the bag at the end of expiration. But that's kind of iffy about actually doing that. That's why we can give asthma and COPD patients now CPAP. Because CPAP is essentially the same as PEEP, right? PEEP is pulmonary and expiratory pressure. CPAP is continuous positive airway pressure. So the, the difference is, is that you're getting a, a back pressure on inhalation and exhalation when you're using CPAP. As opposed to PEEP, you're just getting a back pressure on an exhalation. Does that kind of make sense? <clears throat> yes. So we can use them, depending on whatever you have in your department. Okay. So I have 1225, uh, 130, be back, have fun. We'll do lab when we come back.